Welcome to the podcast where relationships, confidence, and determination all converge into an amazing heartfelt experience. This is Speaking from the Heart. Welcome back to episode number 31 of Speaking from the Heart. Today we have our first international guest, Mark Snow, whom I've had the privilege of knowing for many years as a result of my Toastmasters experiences. Mark is always in the big picture as he is a learning and development specialist who helps people and organizations work smarter and not harder, especially doing his project management role. With his talents as a spreadsheet junkie and a data storyteller, he takes complex things and makes them easy to understand. He is also a wine geek and educator, in which he has earned several types of certifications in this field. He is a community volunteer, not only with Toastmasters, but also with Rotary, and local LGBTIQ plus organizations. He enjoys travel, considering himself a fiend as he tries to get a few more countries visited in this post-COVID world. And that was really a big topic of conversation, not only during our interview, but allowed us to get to know a little bit more from outside of a United States perspective about why this travel is so important and why it's so important to explore all the different types of things that are in our lives. I really have gotten to know Mark over the years as being somebody that has not only lived life to the fullest, but has taken some of his talents, not only in the professional realm, but has expanded himself to become a worldwide influencer. And I really enjoyed having that conversation about not only the ways in which we can ask the why question, but how we can feel more comfortable knowing that we can be uncomfortable at the same time. With that, let's go to the episode. All right, I am here with Mark Snow. Mark, thanks for sharing your heart with us today. Hey, Josh, good to be back. And yeah, great to catch up again. Absolutely. Mark, I got to let the audience know that you are my first international guest on Speaking from the Heart Mark is from Australia, everybody. So thank you, Mark, for taking some time and being able to do this. I know there's an incredibly big time difference between both of us right now, and I'm super excited, nevertheless, to have you part of it. Uh, It's one of the great things about living in Australia is most of the time you're living in the future, so get to see everything before everyone else does. (laughs) You definitely do. (laughs) Mark, I... I already let the audience know a lot about you, and I'm really excited about the fact, too, that you're a Toastmaster that I've gotten to know over the last several years. So for those that are interested in Toastmasters, you know the drill. I'm going to put a link in the episode notes about how you can get started in Toastmasters and meet incredible people like I have with Mark and being able to learn a lot more about not only myself, but also other people. Mark, I want to start with this. I read in a lot of the things that you do, which I sort of knew, but I sort of did not, that you like to deal with a lot of spreadsheets. You are essentially a data junkie. Can you tell us a little bit about what you specifically mean by that? Spreadsheets are wonderful. It's that ordered sort of thinking and being able to bring things together, almost like a bit of a puzzle. And people sometimes don't get it. They're like, oh, why do you do that? It makes no sense. And it's like, it's how I stay organized. I don't know how people can just write things down and not store them or just not be able to pull it together. Spreadsheets for me are a way of bringing complex information together, making it simple, and then telling that story. And I think that is the real use of a tool like Excel or Power BI or whatever else is it's about taking all of that information and turning it into something that other people can understand, use, and enjoy. I've been able to do that myself at my own position too. I also do data analytics for state government where I also manage procurement spending, looking at contracts, all those things. And I'm always telling a story to somebody that needs to have that information, especially for the variety of different things. In your typical day-to-day, I know that you do a lot of project management. How does that data help you to make decisions? It's funny, actually. I'm a state public servant as well, so it's nice to meet another person working in the community interest. It's great. I think there's probably a big difference between the United States version, which is where I'm from, and an Australian version, where you're from. (laughs) Oh, I think surely the frustrations are the same, right? 
trying to do the best you can within the confines of the system that you're given. And my public service career has been pretty diverse. I started out very much as a graduate in our treasury department and using that policy, that financial knowledge. And then I've kind of sort of bounced around to project management and strategic capability and training and development. This has been a really interesting journey. And project management is, again, something that is fundamental to not just the public service, but sort of all sorts of careers. And being able to have a plan is the fundamental thing. It's having a plan and working it because so many projects fail because they haven't been thought through properly and people have just been so eager to jump in that they haven't actually thought about the risks or they haven't thought about the next steps. They haven't thought about, well, who do I need to get on board to be able to make this thing as smooth as possible? And it's always sad, I think, to see really good projects fall over and really good people get burned out and frustrated because they didn't put enough time in the front planning out what they needed to do. And I think for me, that's where project management comes into its own is being able to make things smooth because even with good planning, a a big project can be difficult enough to get across the line. And yet, if you do it well, you can generate so many results for your community, for your business, and even just for yourself as well. It really builds your reputation as someone who knows what they're doing. If you know how to take a project, manage it well, and look after all of the all the bits and pieces along the way. I have that problem myself when it comes to project management, except that the project management I do is working with people that are trying to also plan their own goals, whether that is through life coaching, whether that is doing something like public speaking, which some of them have their biggest fears, which you and I both understand very well, being that we're both experienced Toastmasters. Mark, Mm -hmm. when you are working with all kinds of different personalities in order to understand how to best move forward with that project, especially the planning part of it. Are there any particular strategies that you employ that help you to get people to buy into what you're trying to do to make sure that it is achieving the objectives? What's your methodology or what's your strategy? I think there's a real need to set the vision up front and be really clear about Who are your stakeholders? So who is going to be involved in this project? Not just the people that are going to be working on it on the project, but also who's going to benefit from it? Who's going to have influence over it? Who are the decision makers? Who are the stakeholders that if they decide they like or don't like the project can possibly get in the way or help lift it up? And really getting those people into the room, whether you get them all collectively together or you reach out to them one-on-one, putting that time into building that relationship and talking them through the vision. There's a saying by Saint Exupery, a medieval sort of philosopher, and he sort of said, if I want a ship built, I don't tell men to go out and get rope and cut down trees and bring wood and whatnot. I make them yearn for the open ocean. And I think that is how you sell that vision, is you really have to talk about what does the future look like if this is all done, if it lands the way it's supposed to, what does that future look like? How is it going to help people? How is it going to reduce burdens? How is it going to make the world a better place? If you can describe that in really good detail and then start talking back how you plan to make that happen and think about everything and address everything that could go wrong along the way, that's where you start to build trust. And once you build trust in the work that you're doing, it's a lot easier to get their support. And that is something, even with the project that I'm working on at the moment, which is going to be sort of a five, six year project, There's so many different stakeholders and there's a cultural element as well to play with. And people really appreciate you taking the time to meet with them and to listen and basically make that. I know what you were trying to say is that we're all trying to essentially achieve the same outcome, but we're all coming at it with different ships as well with the way that we maybe built it, the way that we got there in the first place. Maybe there was great wind. Maybe there wasn't as much Mm -hmm. wind. There's all kinds of different variables. Let's move on to something that I find really interesting, and I found it really particular that you've picked this up over the last several years. Wine, which I think everybody enjoys. Mm -hmm. I must be the outlier because I am not a wine connoisseur, and I really 
Don't know if it's just because of my upbringing or having anything to do with that. Although there was plenty of vineyards around Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is really known for in the United States also as having a great vineyard selection. But Mark, tell us why you got into being an educator or geek, essentially, as you have put it, with wine. Wine is one of those things I've sort of hadn't understood for a long time, but then I was actually on a visit to Sonoma County in California and was able to stop in at a winery and really work through their selection in a sort of very measured way. Sort of an enlightenment for me, just in terms of, oh, this is something that I'm really interested in finding out more about. And I kind of put that on the shelf for quite a while until COVID came along. And COVID, I think one of the silver linings of COVID, despite all of the terrible things that have happened, is that it really forced a lot of people, and I'd sort of say most people, to really step back and almost kind of reevaluate where they were heading in life in terms of, oh, the world could end tomorrow from this world-ravaging disease. Have I done everything in life that I want to do? And are there things that I've been putting off that I should actually start doing? And wine was one of those things where I was like, oh, so I've been putting this off for a while, but I'm really interested in it. And I should probably get started on that rather than just letting it sit there and regretting not ever doing anything with it and that kind of got me started i found wine is is an interesting topic because there's a process to it in terms of how it's made there's so much variety it's a great opportunity to travel which is one of my sort of loves but what i do enjoy is sharing knowledge and being able to help other people sort of move along that path to, to greater understanding themselves and so i really fell into that wine education space using some of those toastmaster skills and the training skills from my own work Bringing that and connecting that to the wine space has been really interesting because it's how do you take that innovation in learning and and adult education and bring that into a field that hasn't had a lot of that thinking necessarily applied to it. So it's fun to use new methods of helping people learn and to be creative and to have some fun with it, which I think people sort of think of wine as being this fairly serious, fairly elitist kind of field sometimes, whereas actually it's open to everyone but it's how do you connect that field and all of the complexity that comes with it necessarily to people in the real world and how do you make it enjoyable? That is always a big part of any sort of job or even any sort of personal experience is being able to find the connection in which we really thrive and enjoy and basically live the life that we really want to do. And this business and I started, I can relate to what you just said because I am now doing something that I feel is my true calling and been doing it for now over nine months and been enjoying that aspect of it for what it can do for so many people. With that said, do you find it that even though there are some people that come through and want to learn more about wine, that maybe they struggle or they have a hard time grasping those sort of things or even some of the people that are like super excited and they want to jump all over you and you have to tame that down. Again, kind of similar to what I asked you at the project management. Are there different strategies that you employ with that? And how do you get everybody onto the same page? Because I would imagine that it might be pretty simple, but what you're telling me is, yeah, everyone can easily do it, but I don't know what the struggle is sometimes with maybe somebody learning about that sort of trade. Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. I think it comes down to, again, people learn differently. We sort of see the world differently. We have different perspectives. We absorb information in different ways. And the traditional way of sort of learning things is very much that sort of lecture style where it's someone at the front of the room just talking. And that's not really a dialogue. That's almost a sermon. And for those who are churchgoers, sermons can be meaningful, but for a lot of people, it is just sitting there in the pews kind of being talked at and it not really kind of sinking in, just more washing over. But how do you take a concept, something that's abstract, and make it real? And in the wine space, it's thinking about, well, let's look at maps, let's look at topography, let's talk about the process and actually sort of demonstrate it as much as possible. Let's go out and taste the differences and talk through what we're seeing and feeling and smelling and whatnot and using that as a basis of making it real i think learning is about taking a concept and bringing it to the real world because it's 
very easy to talk about something in the abstract, but no one necessarily grasps it until they can see it, touch it, smell it, taste it, feel it in front of them. At that point, it becomes a lot more understandable and that then helps with the learning process. So I find that is my way of doing it and really trying to keep it interactive rather than just being a one directional sort of sermon, making it a conversation, getting people involved, sharing what they know, their experiences, what they like, what they dislike, and not making people feel inferior. It's how do you build people up through the teaching process rather than having them feel like they've been torn down or necessarily embarrassed because they don't know something. It's making it a safe space to ask questions, to have opinions, and to sort of learn as a group rather than it's someone who's streets ahead who's kind of making everyone else feel a bit uh, less than. That last part of what you just said really makes me want to ask this question because, as you mentioned, you are an avid traveler. You've probably been to many different countries. I know that I personally got to meet you in 2019 at a Toastmasters convention in the United States. And I know that you weren't born and raised in the United States like I have been. And the attitudes, the perceptions, the mindsets, especially in the United States, as opposed to, let's say, another country, are definitely vastly different. With that said, and what you've been learning a lot with even teaching others about your craft of Rhine, do you see it that it's all about what people are perceiving as whether it's a reality or not, whether it's really easy for them to achieve things? Because in the United States, I would say that a lot of people think it's really hard. If you would know somebody or if you have money to back it up, that makes a big difference. Do you feel like that's something similar in Australia? Do you feel that might be something similar in other countries? Tell me your thoughts on that. I think in Australia, the system is a lot more egalitarian. We don't have the wide disparities that you sort of see in the United States in terms of wealth, influence, social status. I mean, we still have obviously rich people and we have people who are less fortunate, but the curve is a lot narrower and therefore there's a greater sense of social mobility and a greater sense of fair play, or as we sort of call it in Australia, fair dinkum. It's about how do you make the most of your life and how do you create those opportunities for yourself? Australians in particular are really big travellers. We tend to be a bit more cosmopolitan in that sense. Where It's funny because Australia, our country is as big as the United States. It's a country and a continent in its own right. And yet we spend so much time trying to almost get away and to explore other parts of the world because we sort of feel like we're kind of there at the bottom of the earth, very isolated from the rest of what's going on. And so you find the average Australian does have a passport. They do travel. They get out to Southeast Asia. They get to Europe. They get to the United States. They get to Africa. And really trying to explore and learn more. I think we have this, because we're a young country, even younger than the United States, There's this sense of this hunger for knowledge and curiosity about the world and our place in it. And you find Australians get everywhere. You can go to almost any city in the world and there's probably an Australian in a bar, serving beer, talking in that terrible, terrible Australian accent. (laughs) But but that's, that's who we are. We love to travel. We love to explore. It's very much that frontier vibe that we've carried with us almost through our whole history. Even with that, You say something that really resonates with me in that there's a sort of curiosity of willing to expand your mindset. And I feel that in the United States, particularly some portions of our country, there is no expansion of that. It's I learned this growing up. This is my mindset. I want to stick with this because this is all I know. Thinking about that sort of process and how we learn and how we identify, because you have done this throughout most of your life, would you say that there's opportunity for anyone to be able to learn and expand their mindset with that, with even the cultural differences or even the things that we do in a work setting from your perspective? Because I could tell my audience day in, day out about what we could do here in the United States, but This is a global podcast, first off. I've always had that in my attention. And you broke that glass ceiling for me today by being part of this. But at the same token, I really want to know 
What drives you, Mark, for being a international traveler yourself? I think travel is the greatest investment you can make in yourself because it has so many benefits. It expands your horizon. It keeps you humble. It really grounds your perspective and it lets you know in some ways how fortunate you really are just to be able to travel. It is a huge privilege in and of itself, but it stretches your comfort zone. And I think for a lot of people that can be challenging. It can be painful sometimes because you are pushing the boundaries of who you are and who you think you are and what you think you can handle. There's another great saying that I like. It's the ship is safe in harbour, but that's not what ships are built for. So you can just stay in this very sheltered place, just not doing anything, just living in the day-to-day and being really comfortable. But comfortable doesn't help you grow. You grow when you're challenged. You grow when you stretch. You grow when you try new things. And yes, sometimes you make mistakes. It's being able to travel through some parts of the world where there's huge disadvantage and coming from a relatively wealthy country like Australia, it's confronting to sort of see that there are parts of the world where this still happens. And that creates a certain sense of gratitude in yourself, but it also helps broaden your thoughts around, well, how can you be of service and how can you give back to that world because you realize how privileged you are and where you sit within it. Being able to explore countries with different cultures challenges your ways of thinking and the beliefs that you might have had in the world about certain countries, certain people, certain politics, all of those things where you can see other places where people are doing things differently and doing it well. People can be happy doing things differently to how you think things should be done and what makes you happy. And I think being able to go to those places and explore and be happy that other people are happy doing things differently to you is a real sign of self-growth and maturity where you start to shift from the way that you see the world is the only valid way of doing something through to actually there's lots of different ways to achieve happiness or to achieve success Mm -hmm. and they're all valid too there are many different ways of living life and going about life that are also valid and i think that is a hugely powerful realization for many people. And you don't have to have lots of money or or lots of influence or lots of success to be able to travel. It's amazing how many people don't explore even their own neighborhood necessarily. Sometimes it is just going to a different part of town that you've never been before. It's moving to exploring the town one state over. It's how can you create those opportunities in your day-to-day life to try new things, to explore the unexplored, to find the unexpected and just create a bit of wonder in the world. Because I, for me, find that sense of awe and wonder and curiosity and inspiration drives a lot of what I do. That sort of real desire to get out, just learn more and soak up everything about the world, even though it's not really possible to do that over the course of one's life. But that motivated to go out and learn and to explore and to take the world with a sense of openness and to really be open to learning about new things and to challenging the way that you might see yourself in the world, that helps you grow so much. And bringing it back to, say, a corporate or a work professional context, it's volunteering for new projects. It's putting your hand up for things that might be outside your role description, but are going to teach you new skills or are going to introduce you to new people. It's taking the opportunity to go to that conference or to take up that training session. It's how can I do what I already do in a different way that might actually end up being a better way of doing it, but I've just never had the time or the inclination to try it that way before. There's so many different ways you can apply curiosity to the real world. And the great thing about it is it keeps you humble because you will make mistakes. There will be things that you try that don't work out. You will hit dead ends and you'll have to backtrack. But In doing that, you learn things. You learn things about what you're doing. You learn things about the world. You learn things about your work and you learn things about yourself. And all of those together, the more you learn about yourself, the more you grow. And as you grow over time, you keep doing that consistently. Eventually, you become a much more different and I'd argue a much more rounded and a much better person than the sort of the little seedling that you might be or you might feel like now you actually start to bloom and blossom over time because you're exposing yourself to new experiences and broadening out the breadth of your own mind. Wow. 
That was the longest answer to a question that I have given, Mark, because I'm sitting here and I'm listening to you and thinking about it. And no, you weren't rambling because all of it had great context. Because for me, I'm sitting back thinking, yeah, maybe I should be doing a lot more traveling. And maybe I should be visiting places that are just in the other parts of town where I live here in Pennsylvania and actually explore what those avenues are so that I can have a better understanding of the bigger context. And even for me being a business owner starting out in the last several months, I've learned a lot about what are some of the people that are making this big engine happen and is helping me to understand that I'm just a small little peon in this bigger palace that is being operated by all kinds of different people and having those perspectives and having those stories and having that understanding creates a lot of different things for all of us you have been all over the place i imagine maybe different places maybe not only in australia but maybe around the world and i just want you to identify one place that maybe opened your eyes to that potential that you didn't realize you had, or you maybe changed your mindset and something that you once thought, this is what I'm going to think about, but now you don't think about it the same way after that experience. Could you tell us a little bit about where that was, that where it happened and why that was significant for you and how I got to know and how our audience got to know the Mark Snow that we're talking about right now? I think the first time I travelled overseas by myself, which would have been a six-week tour of Southeast Asia, travelling through Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos. And six weeks is a long time to be travelling anywhere. But that part of the world in particular has a lot of natural beauty. It also has a very long history that you don't hear enough about because it's Southeast Asia and in the Western world, at least, the view of history is very Anglo-centric. I found for me, there was lots of things I was learning, just seeing all the sites, all the culture, all of these places of great natural beauty. And for me, that challenged so much of my thinking of the world. And it was like opening up a door and realize, oh, there's this big room full of wonderful things that I've never explored or never seen or heard or, or tried before. And once you sort of realize that that door is there and it can be opened, you start looking around in your own mind for all the other doors that might be out there that are still closed that you haven't opened yet. And then you kind of become a bit of a junkie for that experience of really just opening those doors and just exploring what there is to explore and finding out what there is to find, the curiosity that drives you. And because the more you learn, it becomes, like I said, it's very much like an addiction where you get addicted to learning and exploring and expanding your mind. Some people take LSD and other people, we travel to expand our minds, you know, there's different ways of achieving the same thing. But that's the thing that I think really drives me is just really that curiosity to learn more about the world and to try new things. As you can imagine, when you travel, there's always the opportunity to try new things, new experiences, new food. And Southeast Asia, there's quite a lot of cultural cuisine that is very off the beaten track in terms of what we would consider in the US or Australia. It's, for instance, tarantulas, scorpions, silkworms, moths, all of those wonderful things that are, again, you can take the opportunity and you can say no, but then by saying yes to that, right? Yes, it's a story that you then get to talk about, but it also like, oh, this is an experience. This is something new. And you realize, actually, these things aren't too bad after all. Am I going to serve tarantula soup to my house guests in the future? Probably not but it's a story and it's something that I can say that I've tried. And when other people kind of step back and are slightly scared or slightly reluctant to try new things, it's like, well, look, I ate a tarantula. This can't be as bad as that, surely. Definitely. And I have to tell you that my face cringed up when I heard about moths and tarantulas, not really the delicacy of most places in the United States, the hamburgers, hot dogs, Macaroni and cheese. Is surprisingly good. Yeah. Yeah. Crunchy. I bet it is. Probably tastes like chicken. Because <laughs> we like our no, chicken no. sandwiches over here, especially in the Western part of the world. But Mark, we're getting closer to the end of our time here. And I have one last question that I was boiling up inside of me that I think that might give us a perspective that 
especially since you are our first international guest, I think it would be really appreciated to my United States listeners of this podcast. When you are thinking about all the things that you have done in your life and the many adventures that even you just said in the last question that I'm still wrapping my head around that answer because it was so incredible with the many different things that you have talked about that I really would love at some point to piece it down maybe in a future episode. But what is a way in which all of us can have the same level of curiosity as you when it comes to exploring the data that lives in our world, having the ability to taste some of the most unique cuisines, whether that is wine, whether that is food, whether that is different cultures. What drives you to have that curiosity, A, but also what would you say to somebody that is figuring out having that sort of level of interest or that mindset what do you think would be a good first step for somebody to do that? And especially the things that you have done in your life. Can you share us a little bit of that before we close it out? Yeah, sure. I think in some ways it's almost going back to that childhood state of being the annoying six-year-old that's constantly asking the question, why? You know, Why do people eat this? Why do people rave about this place? Why do people do things this way? If you sort of use that question, why, as often as you can and build that into your habits almost of mental thinking, then you start to become curious and you start to think beyond what you see in front of you and you start to look a little bit deeper. And that's where the real meaning in life comes from. It's not just what you see on the surface. It's actually looking below the surface and trying to understand what makes something tick. Why does something act the way it does? Why does that place have such a great review? I think that's how you start to build curiosity. In terms of turning that into action, it is getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. And whether it's once a day or once a week, doing something that takes you a little bit out of your comfort zone. Maybe you go to a dance lesson. Maybe you get up and do some community theater. Maybe you try a sport that you haven't played before. Maybe you go to a networking event and talk to people that are complete strangers that you don't know. I think if you start to make a habit of pushing yourself out of your comfort zone little by little, over time, you start to stretch how far you push yourself out. For instance, maybe this week you go to a small networking event, maybe it's a business networking group, and then in a month's time, you go to a conference where you've got maybe 300 people that are in the room that you can possibly meet and talk to. And then eventually you start to expand that in sort of logical ways. So I think that's how you take that curiosity, how you build curiosity, and then how you turn that into expanding your life and your experiences because life's too short to just be living in this tiny box that you've created for yourself. And whether it's a gilded cage or it's something a little more mundane, once you sort of open that door and you step outside and you see what lies on the other side, whether you like it or not, you now know something a bit more about the world. And that if we are the sum total of our experiences, our knowledge, all of those things that we've acquired throughout life, then the more knowledge and the more experiences that we have, the more people we meet, the more connections and relationships we make, then the more of us, like the better version of ourselves we're going to be because we're constantly adding and expanding to who we are over time. And that means that in the end, we become better people. And that's what life's all about. Mark, I'm smiling over here because you're saying exactly the same things in which I started this business that I'm at and how that mindset is so desperately needed in some parts of the world and even in some parts of our countries, both of ours, where I think just changing that status quo or to use your words, to break out of that prison that we put ourselves in so that we can explore and try the things that we're not comfortable with it can help us to broaden those horizons. And I have to say to close this, that you helped me broaden my horizons when I met you so many years ago. And I am so honored that we've continued to have this friendship despite distance, despite what the time difference is. But more importantly, for the fact that you have always spoke from the heart to me way before this podcast ever became in existence. So for that, Mark, Thanks for speaking from the heart on this official podcast today. 
And I really enjoyed our conversation. But more importantly, I appreciate your worldview being shared with our audience. Thank you for that. Thanks, Josh. It's been a pleasure. And yeah, enjoyed the journey that we've shared so far and looking forward to what comes in the future. Again, I want to thank Mark for being part of Speaking from the Heart. He's been one of those influencers in my life that even in my past times in which I was struggling the most, he was always there from an international perspective, from the time zone that he's in, which he's far into the future, but he always looks back and helps those that are desperately needing help. And that's always been his trait, his characteristic, his way of doing things. If you are interested in learning more about Toastmasters, as I always mention in my episodes when I feature Toastmasters guests, please check out www.toastmasters.org, and I'll have that in the episode notes in which you can find a local club closest to you. Why? Because we are always asking that question of why we should do certain things, just like joining Toastmasters. And I think Mark actually brought that up to a context in which all of us need to understand how we can view the world. I always have found the world to be very overwhelming, especially when I was a child growing up. And it made me very unsettled. It made me feel uncomfortable about what might be out there. Growing up on a farm myself and realizing that there are many other opportunities outside of that farm I was just afraid of where those paths would take me if I were to venture on them. It might be as easy as going on a hunt. You're not sure where you're going to get the next big game or be able to help yourself find that opportunity down the road of helping others find their voice to tell the story. It might be even something completely out of the norm in which you are looking for that item at the grocery store, searching through all the different aisles, hoping that maybe you don't have to ask anybody for help. Yes, I was one of those people. Mark today really described a lot of things for us that makes us understand a little bit better about what we should be yearning for. And hearing it from an international perspective, especially being someone that is from the United States, really helps me to broaden my worldview of what's truly important, not only in life, but what we can assign as important when the time is right. Ah, when the time is right. Is there ever a right time? Having a plan to do that is so important. And even some of the things that Mark talked about today, even shared some of those concepts of what is really involved, what is really important and being able to take on those responsibilities, which I really probed him quite a lot when it came to being able to go into the wine industry and talking about why that is such a passion, why he wants to go and seek out different worldviews. One of the things that I do for even my business is think about the different opportunities and advantages that are out there for not only people that are struggling to find their voice and to tell their story, but to even just find something to latch on to, to begin with. I always think that allowing ourselves time to reevaluate when it's truly needed is necessary. And being able to carve out that time, especially in the ever busy world that we live in, is very much a big struggle. I'm sure that as you're listening to this, you're probably working, typing away on your keyboard, sending that next email, Maybe you have a presentation that you have to send to your boss. Maybe that four-year-old child that you have is coming up to you, pulling your leg, saying, Mommy, Daddy, did you forget to feed me? It's time to eat. Or, Mommy, Daddy, I want to play with you. Can we go outside? And I know that it's all about prioritizing. Prioritizing in an international context, though, takes it to a whole new level. I think if anybody ever casually studied cultures across the world, you know that the value of time is completely different in each scenario. If you look at even some of the European countries, especially Spain, where they have a sort of siesta during the middle of the day for their workers in order to take enough time to not only enjoy lunch, maybe even catch a quick nap, or maybe even do some things at home before they go back and they work in the early evening. 
And I know if that maybe that might be very foreign to many of us to think about having that long break in the middle of the day. Why not just wrap it up? Why can't we just work a straight sort of hour so that we know that we can be done at a certain time? I know that for many of us, being able to understand all those different variables might be exhausting. You might be asking yourself, well, I don't live in that culture and I don't plan to live in that culture, Joshua. So why does it matter to me? It matters a lot. I think for some of us, trying to have that sort of conversation with ourselves where we're able to work on not only our best versions of ourselves, but to find the relationships, confidence, and determination often means looking at it from a different perspective. It means changing your schedule. The definition of insanity is essentially doing the same thing over and over again, thinking that you're going to have a different outcome. And I think I lived in that insanity type of world for many years, many decades, in which I thought that if I could push myself one more step, if I can get that one more certification, if I can get that one more award, I can please everyone. I can do anything that I could potentially do just so that I can help others. But I have an important question for all those that might agree with what I've been through and you still continue to live that way. Is that living your full life? Do we just sit here? Or do we just do something about it? Do we continue to be a little crazy? Or do we continue to do something about where we are at in order to bring home money, wealth, fame, whatever the case might be? I think we have heard numerous guests on this show share those examples of really tying it all back to one thing. Connection. We all strive for it. Sure, travel might not be in your budget because traveling internationally can be very expensive. But for some people, even in places like Australia where Mark is from, that can be the greatest investment in yourself and which can create new opportunities where you never thought possible. And asking why can be the most important question of them all to understand and look at the world in a completely different way. So yes, I'm not debating that maybe you should spend more time with your kids instead of listening to this podcast. But I would love more listeners. I would love more people to understand what that concept is so that they can become richer, fuller, and have that opportunity to do just that. It's all about feeling uncomfortable to be able to do just that. And some people are never ready to have that conversation. And it's not because they aren't equipped to do it. It's because there has to be something that changes. It has to be something that allows us to become the best version of what we want to become next. Because we're always growing. We're always pushing ourselves to that next level. And that's exactly what I do. I help people realize that. But you also have to ask yourself a question if you are afraid of doing such a thing. Can you possibly do it? knowing that there will be opportunities to stretch yourself, to pull yourself into a completely different direction, or even make yourself feel like you are a small piece of this overall world that we live in. Earth is very big. It's vast with its mighty oceans, dangerous terrains, extreme climates, but there are people, places, and things to do that can embrace us, can increase our visibility, and can make us soar to new heights. I think that for anything, it doesn't matter whether you're looking at a spreadsheet, it doesn't matter if you're managing a project, it doesn't matter if it's just a casual stroll outside in your backyard wherever you live. It's all about understanding that passion and that commitment to being willing to see what the vast frontier is out there. And I think we all know that if we can be a little bit like Mark, if we can just be a little bit more open to the possibilities that exist out there, we can and will 
not only become the best versions of ourselves, but I think that we might actually be a little bit of an influencer ourselves. And that is what's really important. Having that connection, having that drive, and having the willingness to share what's on our heart. Thanks for listening to episode number 31 of Speaking from the Heart, and I look forward to hearing from your heart very soon. Thanks for listening. For more information about our podcast and future shows, search for Speaking from the Heart to subscribe and be notified wherever you listen to your podcasts. Visit us at www.yourspeakingvoice.biz for more information about potential services that can help you create the best version of yourself. See you next time.